Hello and welcome back to theCUBE coverage here at Black Hat in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE's coverage. We're in our filming CUBE studio suite. We call it the luxury box of content. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here with CUBE alumni, Brian Carter, who's the co-founder and CEO of Bedrock Security, former with uh, Sumo Logic. Uh, I think you've been on like at least 20 times, Bruno. In fact, 2013, our first AWS reInvent, <laughs> we were on, you were on uh, with Sumo Logic. Great to see you, thanks for coming on. Thank you, it's great to be here again. Uh, I know you just came off uh, uh, pneumonia and, and a cold, so we'll, we'll take a well, light wait here. But I really want to get into it. You, you've seen many waves of innovation, multi uh, uh, startup entrepreneur, um, you've seen opportunities, you've seized them, you've built great value in, in your ventures. Uh, Simply soon a was legendary. Um, now Bedrock, the market's different. As an entrepreneur, again, seasoned entrepreneur, as you look at the opportunity out there, um, how, what did you see? What was Bedrock about? What was the key catalyst for Bedrock security and how does that fit into some of the narratives we're seeing today? Uh, great question. Um, what I saw is the fact that the whole purpose of security efforts in an enterprise are really, they all exist to protect data. But there was really no way to put data at the center of security efforts. Most of our efforts, including at Sumo Logic, were to try to secure users, networks, infrastructure, servers, but it was all in the hope to secure data. And there was multiple different problems that were standing in the way of actually securing data. And one was, you know, being able to cope with the scale of that data and the other one was understanding what's in the data so you know what to protect. You know, I did a little um, survey of just a spot survey in the security category, InfoSec or information security. There's like 13 categories these days. I mean, we got managed service, endpoint protection, and all different approaches. And then, but there's so much product sprawl. I did a tweet storm yesterday and, and you know, I'm just, all this, what consolidating vendor? No one's consolidating, it's gotten worse. Um, mainly because of the threats. So you got all these categories, they're kind of legacy. Um, so the, it seems that a lot of weird things are happening, not weird things, but industry things. We're back to silos, but in a way to protect, centralization with data lakes. Um, so the data model seems to be evolving and modernizing towards kind of back to the old way, but different. And, and I want to get your thoughts on this because, you know, in all, all, in all of our generative AI coverage, it comes down to intelligence apps need data. They need it secured, they need it real time, low latency, and it's got to be relevant, which means how data is handled and that's why there's you know, all this discussion around open table formats, um, cataloging is separated from the database. So data's changing. What's your reaction to that? How do you see that, that, that industry? Because you know, performance is great, getting better with, with compute and silicon. Now this next layer is impacted. What is your vision and what's your reaction to that? So data is absolutely changing and uh, it uh, it's hasn't stopped, hasn't slowed down, right? We know from the last decade the digital transformation has really pushed the, the growth of data and the, the creation of heterogeneity of that data, right? So the challenge, I think, my, my view on this is that at a fundamental level, um, enterprises must use their data to differentiate, must use their data to compete. Data is involved in building new products, new services, in optimizing the enterprise, in serving customers better. All of these things are absolutely reliant on data. And now that we are adding new technologies on top of these data lakes and data layers like generative AI, we're starting to really think about, you know, how do we securely and use this data in a sanctioned way rather than just essentially let anybody touch this data, which then creates exposure vectors, it creates all kinds of potential challenges out in the future. And so right now we have sort of the two-sided coin of, of generative AI. One is that it is a tool that can help us understand data much better than we ever could because that's what generative AI, data, AI is all about. And number two, it is also the thing that scares us a lot about how we use that data. So it's both on both sides of that coin. You know, I think we might have talked about this on theCUBE a few times because you know, I've been always talking about data as code and you know, we saw this coming a decade ago, but not to this level of just positive disruption. I mean, I see the market as a disruptive enabler, um, but this idea of like dealing with data you know, you guys have this AI reasoning vision. Um, I don't want to get into that. But thinking about data, not just as a discrete element, but as an active, like almost code, mm -hmm. is becoming more of the same. In fact, uh, one of the trends we're seeing is that there's more, the best AI apps are closer to the silicon as close as possible. So there's almost a shift back to kernel developing. Mm -hmm. I'm a kernel, you know, 
broad yep. term, but you know, system programming, low level code. It seems to be where all the best apps are doing the best performance mm -hmm. because there's a lot of inference, reinforced learning and reasoning comes into that. So the reason you have to understand the data, the context. Can you share your, your vision of Bedrock Security, how you guys are looking at that? Because this seems to be looking at data differently than the old school ways of the database. You know, yeah. like a database. Okay, I had a database and I query it. Now generative is a new category. So how do you see this? So I think the, there's a couple of challenges there. One, before you start reasoning about the data, you first have to know where is your data, right? Because you can't govern or secure or protect the thing that you cannot see. So there are really two fundamental principles that we, the bedrock that takes to heart. First one is we do discovery at scale, meaning we essentially let our system crawl through your environment in a sanctioned way without moving any data to find all nooks and crannies of where your data lives. And this doesn't just mean in your database, it means in your object stores, file systems, in your, in your unmanaged databases, in your document repositories, everywhere where data might live. And once you know where the data is, now you have to figure out what is in that data, right? Because there's enough data out there to, to, to make up a lifetime of anybody's work, right? And so the question is, how do you prioritize your efforts on making sure that you're focusing everything you do on data that's sensitive, that's important, that has PII, that's governed, that's regulated? And so the AI reasoning engine that we built, the whole purpose of that is to apply a generative AI approach, or actually a derivative of that approach, that is used for us to skip over and not have to use rules and tune all of that, but let the, the brains of the large language models actually go and figure out what's in this data so we can tell the operators what they need to focus on. Remember the early days of that when XML was forming, it was always about these framework data about data. Almost we're living in that time now where you have to have data about the data, yes. number one, and two, you store it everywhere. I mean, we still have a distributed computing paradigm developing, and that's mm -hmm. the beautiful thing. So cloud operations on public cloud or on-prem or edge, I mean, it's all cloud native, but it's mm -hmm. distributed computing yep. theory. Mm -hmm. So, okay, if you, if, that, if you believe that, then you say, okay, what's the data strategy for de deploying that? Is it hosted data everywhere? Is it data lakes? How do you see that? So I think the, I think the long <laughs> gone are the days of, of security teams and data teams controlling what's going to happen to their data ahead of time. Developers push code to production every day, many times a day. Data is code, as you said. We're generating data at a tremendous velocity. We're copying that data for testing, development, product development, for model training, for all these things. So the, the, my perspective on this is that you let the data be where the data is going to be. Mm -hmm. But you take a proactive approach to the posture management of the data. So if you have a system that can always find all of your data and can always tell you what's in the data, now you can let the people who are actually generating and using it actually do what they need with that data so that the business can move quickly, but you can be proactive about managing exposure, managing access, managing entitlements, managing all these things that, that matter to your business, right? So rather than trying to prevent things from happening, you make sure that you, are make, that you create processes around the data so that it can be safe. So that's an enablement strategy, right? That way you just, right, I heard you correctly. Okay, great. That sounds a lot like security back 10 years ago. Build security in from day one. How many times have we heard that, right? Yep. I mean, so now are you saying the same thing? Data security is yep. build data governance and catalog management up front and let the data fly? Well, you let the data fly, but what you're doing continuously as the data flies, you're constantly watching where it lands. Mm -hmm. You are doing, you're performing analysis of that data such that you know you said earlier, data about data. We call this metadata, right? We're collecting metadata about data, we're classifying the data, we're determining what's the sensitivity level, what's in the data, what type of documents are these financial documents, are these IP, IP documents and things like that. And we persist that and we use that information now, this meta level information, to govern what happens on the security layer, right? So we're not actually telling people, go build security everywhere. We're actually saying, let the data land where it needs, we will make sure we tell you where it is and we will tell you what it is so you know what to do with it. Bruno, let me get your thoughts on this because one of the things we were speculating with the Cube Research, we just did SuperCloud 7 last week. Yep. Um, we all, obviously, we all, we all saw compute and storage get separated. That was created mm -hmm. a lot of good things. 
Separating data from the database is now where we're seeing all the action. Correct. Um, that's why all the discussions around open table formats and cataloging and governance, mm -hmm. because cataloging is where the action is, not the database, yep. because you can have semi-structured, unstructured, and structured data all playing in these data lakes. And then finally, if you do that right, then you can enable the intelligent applications, which will need free access to all the data wherever it is and let the application get yep. the data, call in, almost like a procedure call, get the data. Yep. That's a paradigm flip. Yep. That, that didn't really exist years ago. Do you believe that to be the case, that this is now a real significant uh, trend that separating the data from the database and then allowing that, I won't say federated catalog, but it's a ca smart catalog, because if you can do the governance up front, you're going to need to then, you can have observability on data. And that's what you're, I think you're saying. Am I it getting is, it right? Uh, you're getting it exactly right. That's the fundamental premise upon which we, what we, that we believe in Bedrock, right? The, the, the data catalog largely has failed the enterprise, right? Data catalogs are typically governed, you know, they're, they're static, they don't, they don't get managed, they're not up to date, they're typically siloed to the, the specific data sources, right? And we are now operating in a world where we can actually construct a live, up-to-date data catalog at scale across all data systems because we have now the ability to find all the data, mm -hmm. to interrogate all the data, and actually persist that data catalog or meta information about the data and then serve it to everybody who needs that data downstream. You know, it's interesting, you know, I, well, I love chatting with you because we're riffing, but also you're getting a lot of knowledge out there. This reminds me of the old networking days when we had policy was a big deal. Kind of in a way the policy's built in and the generative aspect of the data is just handled at, I won't say runtime, but kind of run call time. Yeah. Um, it seems to be the trend. Okay, so if that's the case, I want to get your, your reaction to this. Um, our observation with the CUBE research team and some of the things we've been having on CUBE conversations on the CUBE is, is that it seems to be that the people doing the best with Gen AI have two common characteristics. One is they have somewhat good handle of their data. I mean, not perfect, no one's perfect, but like they're not in the stone age, living in the data warehouse only days. And they have end-to-end -end workloads, end-to-end -end processes. Uh, because they can see everything end to end because they actually have workloads running, banking apps, yep. stuff, pre-generative AI. They seem to be doing the best. Um, do you, what's your reaction to that? Is that, is that so something you see? And, and, uh, uh, and just to kind of verify it, I did a tweet yesterday, I ended up getting thousands of views, that's just a comment to someone else. I said, vertical integration and end to end workflows is the new developer playbook with open source code for speed. Kernel developers will rise as it's a systems revolution. Your, your reaction to that tweet and also this idea that, you know, that we're seeing end to end. Yeah, I, I, do, I do agree that, that end to end workflow um, and vertical integration allows you to actually have, you know, the control of what goes into your generative AI. The challenge with generative AI projects today, there's many, many of them ongoing. Mm -hmm. Only about 10% of them go into production. And the reason for that is because once you get to that production stage, somebody in the organization says, are you sure you can guarantee me what went into the system because once it's in the system, it's a black box, nobody can tell what's in it. And with a clever person on the other side of that system, you can get anything out of the system that you want, right? So one of the aspects of this that I think we're trying to solve and we see enterprises struggling with is, are two. One is data bill of materials. What is the data bill of materials? Can you compute and, and create a data bill of materials for all of your generative AI applications so you can guarantee that you know what's going in so you know what's going to come out? That's number one, and that's one of the solutions that we deliver. The number two is something we call trust boundaries. And trust boundaries essentially back to your uh, mention earlier of a policy. A policy basically says like this, we will train, our models will look at your data. They will get trained on your data. They'll understand that certain type of document sensitivity levels are going to be within this, with this category of data, and it's going to be, you're going to draw a boundary around it. What we're going to do then is we're going to monitor as data starts moving and sprawls, if we find anything that's similar to this data that might want to map to this data using generative AI techniques like factorization and embeddings, we will alert you and notify you when anything that's supposed to be within the trust boundary is outside of the trust boundary, right? So those two concepts. It's like a recommendation engine. Exactly, exactly. And it gives you a live view. Hey, you've got something running out of your pen. Put it back in the pen, right? Because you want to know where your sensitive data goes. Right? It might go to a generative AI project that you don't want it to go to, or you, know, you might want it in a bill of materials that goes into it. It's interesting, the instrumentation of data is fascinating. Um, let, 
you know, the world's changed. Go back to when you started Sumo Logic. I mean, that was a while ago, okay? The world's changed. What's different to wait now? Because data's in, in, in everything. It needs to be instrumented. It's, it has to be freely available. What's different about Bedrock that you're doing now that was, that was not possible um, even years ago? It's a great question. Um, at Sumo Logic, when we started Sumo Logic was in 2010, the secular shift of the time was cloud migration. Cloud was becoming a real enterprise technology and it enabled us to disrupt a lot of old school technologies through better architecture, better efficiency, and you know, hands-off management of technologies. Right now, we still benefit from, from cloud migration and majority of the enterprises are still moving to the cloud, but we now have this generative AI secular shift, which enables us to do things we could never do before, right? We can now use essentially artificial intelligence to reason about the data. Uh, what it's really good at, it's really good at looking at data, understanding what it is, summarizing what it is, and even generating things that are based on what it knows. And those things enable us to do things that are so much more powerful than before. Before we had to rely on rules to, to classify data sets. We had to rely on rules to fire alerts. Now we can actually use AI to both augment those rules, to write those rules, and to actually operate within a rule, rule-less environment and essentially d determine what is happening without you having to write and maintain rules, which is opens up a world of opportunity for us. Like right? what? Uh, opens up the ability for us to essentially determine that you know, I have a bunch of sensitive data in here. We have a customer of ours uh, that is in biotech space, which I find an, an, a fascinating use case. What they have is they, they operate on DNA sequencing. And they asked us, we have these DNA sequences that we want to make sure never get used or moved anywhere where it's, they're not sanctioned to be. And we're like, okay, how do you do that by What's regular? Sanctioned? <laughs> exactly, how do you do that by regular expression? You can't. Right? What they wanted to know is if anybody copies a, a section of a DNA sequence and it appears somewhere else in the infrastructure, they want to know about it immediately because that's a violation of internal rules. We trained our engine, our generative AI engine, on their sequences and we can take a fragment view of these sequences and we can detect even if somebody modifies a sequence that it is, that it is coming from the original that needs mm -hmm. to be tracked. Right? That was never possible before. This is only possible now because we have this derivative generative AI approach for it. You know, I, I, am, I share your enthusiasm and I want to get your expert thoughts on this next discussion around neural networks. Um, in fact, you mentioned vector embeds. There is now, I would say also the new possibility that digitization is going to happen much faster. Okay, so let's just say that Bedrock Security will go the trajectory of Sumo Logic. You guys create this really cool layered out smart data. You understand everything. What's going to happen next is you're going to digitize the data so it'll be in some sort of neural network form, say math, not, mm -hmm. key, not expression or rules. So that's the, yeah. the value is to be smart about kind of where things are at scale. That's the big thing. What's, what is a neural network? For people out there watching, whether they're a CXO, CISO, CDO, whoever, people who are really trying to think about the foundation for the next 20 years of their business, um, you're starting to see some digitization even on the currency side. Obviously, Bitcoin is, is getting more traction with government and corporations, and you're going to see online digitization. Maybe even media is digitized someday, and, 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 but things are stored differently. Mm -hmm. A neural network is not necessarily database. It's just, and, and also different fields. What's your, how would you explain this wave of neural networking everything? Yeah, to keep or it, is that the right word? No, nah, I mean, it, it, it is, and it's an interesting concept, and I'll keep it, try to, try to keep it on a level um, sort of that, that my business, that our business audience can understand. Um, neural network is essentially um, a representation of, of the way that, that human brain actually, it's based on some of the visual cortex of, of how it works. And, and it, what it does, it essentially can consume information in such a way where it synthesizes it in a way that, that using that plus the transformer model, which was the sort of addition to it during the generative AI, um, uh, explosion enables us to effectively train a brain on a bunch of data and then ask it questions using these similarity models such as vector embedding, cosine similarity and others that can really quickly associate something in a very high precision way with 
something that it is similar to and it is relevant to the question. And, right? big, and big sets of data too, not? Huge sets of data, like internet sized sets of data. So it can essentially enable you to take all of your massive caches of data, and you know what, what it looks like when you try searching for a bit of data in, yeah. your, in your data repository. What a neural network and the generative AI model will allow you to is not find a bit of data, it will help you find the answers. It'll, it'll be able to jump over many steps of what does it take to search for something, read something, interpret it, and then come up with the answer. It's going to jump all, all, over all of yeah. that and give you the answers. And I think, I think to your point about generative AI and transformer, it's now awakened, I would call a sleeping neural network theory. I mean, neural networks have been around since the 80s. Yep. I remember when I was in computer science, we talked about neural networks, oh yeah, yeah, you know, AI. But now the, the scale of performance of, of hardware in silicon, mm -hmm. the transformer gen AI, that is the secular shift that's going to ignite right. knowledge graphs, mm -hmm. neural nets. Yep. Um, and I think that's going to be a game changer. That's, that's obviously my dog might believe that. I'm going to die on that hill. I think it's going to happen, of yep. course. But that what it, how it comes back to security is what you were saying earlier around reasoning. So now the next step is reasoning. You got reasoning in your product. So you got to be thinking about things differently with, with bedrock security in mm -hmm. the sense that you got some secret sauce out there that's going to reason. Um, can you share, is it, you mentioned vector embeds. What's the, yeah. what's the, how do you get the reasoning right? I mean, cause that's a hard problem. The reasoning in the use case that we are currently focused on is sort of an intersection of three things. One is what's in the data, mm -hmm. two is what are the entitlements to that data once you know what's in it? And three is what is the actual activity you're observing on that data? So the intersection of those three is what we call our AI reasoning engine. And the, the purpose of it is to really try to help us, help our customers understand sort of what is at risk at any point in time in the, within the data, data sets. And what determines something being at risk is, you know, is it sensitive, number one, is it over-provisioned? Is the access to it over-provisioned? Number two, and number three, are people either using it or not using it? If they're not using it, can you restrict usage to it? Can you, you know, uh, wind it back down to least privilege and things like that, right? So that's kind of like what our reasoning engine looks like. And the way that it comes, comes into play, I'll give you another example from a customer who's a financial services customer. You know, we were looking at, you know, crawling through the data and we were like, okay, it looks like you have a bunch of offer letters sitting here in this area in a lower environment that is over-provisioned to people. It says people, people's PII, financial information, all these things that absolutely should not be there. Did you know it was there? And the way we reasoned about it is we looked at a bunch of financial documents in their actual ERP repository and recognized the similarity between the offer letters and those documents that were basically able to tell them, hey, you've got something really sensitive sitting over here. Did you even know? That's kind of the reason. And that was available to people. That's right. Hmm. Great, I mean, that's a, so let's talk about Bedrock, because I think this is what I, sure. everyone wants to know. You guys have got some seed funding, 15 million, Greylock, they invest in your other company, great firm, tier one, um, super set of partners over there. Yep. What problem are you solving with the venture? And what's your expectation? You got customers, you mentioned you have some customers. What's the status of the, of the company? Um, sounds like you guys been going for a while, you got some customers. Mm -hmm. What core problem are you solving? And what's your expectations uh, for this venture? And next next trajectory, the next leg of the journey. Yeah, so the status of the company is we are out of stealth. We have a GA product. We have um, multiple customers who are paying customers who are using us. We have many engagements with new customers, but here's kind of like what we're solving. We're solving at the most fundamental level, the two areas that we talked about earlier. Uh, we call it the bedrock. The bedrock of every enterprise needs to be, can I discover my data? Can I classify my data? That is the foundation. On top of that foundation, once you have that foundation, now you can do many things. You can create a catalog. You can create a metadata repository. You can perform data security posture management if you understand the entitlements. You can perform compliance uh, verifications. Am I in compliance with various regulations? You can do IP tracking like some of our bio, biotech company, com, com, uh, customers and others. But also, as importantly, you can also bring the data context to other security efforts. For example, in Sumo Logic, we had a SIM. One of the big problems in SIM is everybody gets too many alerts and, and can only get through maybe 10% of alerts. Well, what if I could tell you from bedrock which of your alerts overlap with where sensitive data lives? 
Could that be the prioritization engine for you to be looking at alerts? Could I tell your CNAP provider that the vulnerabilities they're discovering are related to the data that is sensitive versus data that is not sensitive? Where should they prioritize their work, right? So in this sort of world where data is growing exponentially and security resources are growing linearly, can I give those security people more direction on what to focus on? And that's also that's helped them very solving. technically. I can also imagine that with that smart kind of cataloging, you can almost, in real time with code, spin up a catalog for an app that's secure. Here's your secure data yep. for your whatever use case. Yep. That's kind of what you're getting to. That's right, and our customers, we everything in Bedrock is exposed through APIs, so we enable our customers to plug, tap into our APIs, essentially bring the data context into every application, into every process that they run. Well, congratulations on the venture, excited to have you back on theCUBE. Final question for you is that when I talk to organizations that are progressively pushing the envelope on replatformizing their enterprise, they're looking at a 20 year horizon. I need to reset my foundation. A lot of it is either inertia, they can't get it done because of politics and other mm -hmm. stuff that's in the way. Other stuff is just they have too much legacy stuff. They can't unwind mm -hmm. what they have. In some of the cases, like they don't even know who implemented the systems or, or where the data is, or we have data somewhere, but yep. where's the person, what's the metadata? Are the patches mm -hmm. all updated? They have this litany of just problems. Mm -hmm. So what's your advice, or well, one, what are organizations ready for bedrock? Um, and two, um, how are they thinking about this replatformization, or is it, or is it a little bit further down the road. Yeah, so it's a great question actually. It's a dual world out there still, right? We've got a lot of people who are cloud native, but many, many people or companies are cloud. They have a bunch of cloud and a bunch of on-prem, right? The, where the data sprawl is happening and explosion is happening in the cloud because that's where developers are moving new apps, that's where the workloads are, that's where generative AI efforts are, that's where the explosion of data is happening, that's where the sprawl is happening. Uh, and then there's all of this legacy stuff that's happening on, on the enterprise side, right? Completely different architectures, completely different requirements for technology being deployed. My basically guidance to, to my customers is focus on where your explosion is happening. Get a handle of your cloud, get a handle of understanding where your data is, get a handle of operating and collaborating with your development teams, security and developers working together to make sure that that's secure and then will walk backwards and solve your legacy stuff. Bruno, great to have you on theCUBE. 11 years ago, you were on for the first time, uh, Sumo Logic, back in the, at, in the saddle, at the helm again uh, of, a, of a startup. Great, out of stealth, congratulations. Thank you. Give a quick plug in for the, look, I'll shake your hand for sure, you're yeah. awesome. Um, and thanks for all the, the master class you just, just laid down. Give a quick plug for uh, Bedrock Security, what you're looking for, obviously you're hiring. Um, give a quick um, basically, we are. We would love to have conversations with enterprises who have large amounts of data, complex data sets, sensitive data sets, uh, at hundreds of terabytes of scale, and come find us at the booth at Black Hat or come to our website. Yeah, about LinkedIn. All right, Bruno's here, laying it down again. The hot startups are going to change the categories. We are expecting out of this secular trend, this next big wave, new brands. Companies that are going to come out of the woodwork we won't even see yet are coming. A whole nother inflection point's coming. Of course, the Cube will have it there for another turn around the track. This is the Cube. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.